All right, welcome back to the channel. On today's video, I want to discuss how technology has impacted and influenced the skilled labor trades, the amount of available jobs, and also the uh, available workforce that we have to fill those jobs. So stick around to learn more. So once again, welcome back to the Maintenance Factory. I'm Drew and I'll be your host for today. So if you're not sure what the Maintenance Factory is about, in a nutshell, we are here to help the best maintenance professionals become even better. And if that sounds like a good idea to you, you can start by subscribing to the channel, clicking the notification bell, and then you will always be connected to you know the latest and greatest content that we're gonna put out. So on to today's topic how technology is killing the skilled labor trades and more importantly how technology has impacted the available uh, jobs or also the available um, the available workforce that we have to move into these skilled labor jobs that will soon be opening over the next several years and some that are vacant currently today so you may be wondering you know, how does technology impact the skilled labor trades? And you may be thinking to yourself, well, he's gonna talk about, you know, how artificial intelligence and how robotics technology has advanced and how that's contributing to fewer and fewer skilled, uh, skilled labor jobs that there are in America, but that's really not at all what today's video topic is about. More specifically, what I wanna talk about is how technology has evolved over the years and how that has basically limited the number of people at, that is coming up through the skilled trades to fill these vacant positions. So what I wanna do is go all the way back to uh, 1946. So what's significant about 1946? Well, that is the first year of the baby boomer generation. That generation spans from 1946 to 1964. Approximately 75 million people were born in America during that time frame. So why is that important? Well, we're gonna to get to that. First of all, I wanna share a little interesting fact. 54% of construction managers today are made up of baby boomers. 40% make up the construction workforce as a whole. That's some pretty significant numbers. So what I would like to do is turn to a uh, spreadsheet that I've got put together and I'll explain to you some of the data that I've got collected in that spreadsheet and I'll then go on to explain a uh, chart where I've graphed out all that information. So let's jump into that spreadsheet right now. Okay, so as promised, here we are. We're looking at some, some numbers that I've put together in a spreadsheet and just to explain it slightly, there's a column for the generation uh, over the years. So as you can tell, we have the baby boomers, Generation X, Millennials, all the way up to 2015. And then we have the work status. So that's, you know, basically if that generation is currently retired, looking ready to retire, uh, hopefully working, and then in school and then not in the workforce. And then we've got uh, each year that, like I said, all the way back to 1946, which is part of our topic for today, their current age as of 2019, and then their approximate retirement year. So if you look right here, this part that's grayed out represents the baby boomers that have retired. Now, this is theoretically speaking, right? This is if you're 65 years of age or older, and we're saying that group of people have already retired and left the workforce. So if you look at right here, these people are no longer in the workforce as of 2019. This right here represents the number of births uh, per year. And I did get that off of a government website. So the numbers should be pretty accurate. And right here, uh, represented by this yellow, is the uh, baby boomers that are looking forward to retirement over the next few years. Okay. <clears throat> so if you look right here. Um, there's a little over 4 million uh, people born in the United States each of these years. And then what that equates to is approximately 10 to 11,000 people per day 
will either retire and leave the job market or they will be drawing some type of benefits from the government. Let that sink in for a second. 11,000 people per day are going to leave the workforce. That's a pretty significant number. And that's going to start next year in 2020. And that's not going to end until we get to 2030. So that's pretty significant. And we're going to talk about just how significant that is here in just a second. Now that you've had a chance to look at the data just a little bit, it's important to note that there are currently 41 million baby boomers that are still out there that have not reached that retirement age. They're potentially in the workforce now. Now, I realize not everyone that is born within those years are still out there working. I understand that. But let's just say for today's sake, there's 41 million baby boomers that are currently in the workforce now. And what's significant about that? Well, as it relates to the skilled labor trades, what we need to do next is take a look at how many baby boomers occupy each sector or each division of the skilled labor trade. So how many baby boomers are electricians? How many baby boomers are welders? How many are machinists? So we need to get a good look at how many baby boomers occupy these skilled trades because remember, they're going to be retiring at a rate of 10,000 people per day. That's pretty significant. So let's jump back into the numbers. Now remember, we have over 41 million baby boomers that are left that are currently still able to occupy the workforce. Now let's take a look at what the Labor Bureau of Statistics says about each of the skilled labor trades. So if you go on their website and look, there's approximately uh, 700,000 electricians in America. There's uh, almost 470,000 machinists, 500,000 plumbers, uh, nearly 400,000 HVAC technicians. And then the list goes on and on. I even added a few uh, engineers, industrial, mechanical, electrical, civil engineers. So let's take a look at why this is so significant. Through some research, I have found some uh, other trusted websites that have given me an indication of how many baby boomers are actually occupying some of these skilled trades. So on this particular website that I looked at, it said that there were 540,000 baby boomers that are electricians. Well, that's pretty significant considering there's only 700,000 electricians in America. So that means that 76% of the electricians in America are baby boomers. And if you look at all of these trades, that number doesn't really get any better. Look at the machinists, for example, it's even worse. That says there's nearly 400,000 baby boomers that occupy uh, trades as machinists. That's 83% of the machinists in America. Look at this number right here for the welders. Over 400,000 baby boomers are welders. That's 95% of that trade. Man, that's significant. If you look down here, I've got some totals. So this right here has totaled up all of the jobs that are comprised of the skilled labor trade. And it's a little over 4 million jobs. And if you look here, this is the total number of baby boomers that occupy those skilled labor jobs. 76% of those trades are occupied by baby boomers. That's, that's a really big deal. So at this point, you may be wondering, how has technology driven us to get to this point and where does it leave us at today? So we're going to address that next. Let's go and look at a chart that's going to date all the way back to 1946. And my data on this chart actually ends in 1980, but let's jump into the chart and I'll explain it. And then we'll get to the technological piece and how that has impacted the skilled labor jobs and the available skilled labor workers that are currently entering the workforce. Okay. So, just right before we jump into the actual chart itself, I want to show you some other columns that I've had populated in this spreadsheet. And what it is, is the number of farms in America, the tractors that were built per year, and then the total number of tractors built from 1946. So in other words, this number accumulates uh, as the years go on. And then I have another column over here that represents tractor horsepower. And this is just kind of a rough idea of the largest, um, most economical tractor that someone could afford 
each year. Now, by no means it is not the very largest tractor that you could purchase in terms of horsepower per year, but um, uh, something that a general person could buy or that a general farmer could buy, this is something that they would have more than likely purchased. And just keep in mind that this is kind of on the, the higher end of horsepowers for tractors on each year. There were most certainly uh, many other tractors that were manufactured each of these years with a significantly less horsepower rating. So now let's uh, jump on into the chart. Okay, so here we are. We have this uh, all this information from the spreadsheet plotted out, several line bars here on this graph. And my graph starts in 1946, and it goes all the way to 1980, and it stops. Now, one thing I want to point out before we jump into this, if we could look previous to 1946, this orange line, which is represented by the number of farms in the U.S., this number is actually plateaued. It's peaked out right here, and it's peaked out for several years, and then it significantly drops back off all the way back to, you know, the mid-1800s. But I don't have that plotted here for today's purposes. And also for tractor production. Remember 1946, that is post-war. And if you can look at tractor production during the war period, we had a pretty significant uh, decrease in the amount of tractors produced. So this is almost horseshoe shaped uh, going back to pre-war times. And then it kind of follows the same trend as uh, the farms in America. It just kind of slowly tapers down to nothing. Now, what's significant about this technology that I've been speaking of, and it, it relates to tractor technology, agricultural technology, manufacturing technology that built these tractors and these implements. That's the technology that I'm talking about. So now I want to explain this graph just a little bit better. So if you look in 1946, there were approximately 6 million farms in America. And then if you fast forward all the way to, you know, the mid 70s, we're down to less than two and a half million farms across America. And if we could run this line on out to, say, 2015, we're right at two million farms, which is this line right here. So really, by the mid 70s, early 80s, we have already reached the minimum number of farms that are in America. And we've basically stayed with the same number of farms current day since the 80s. One thing that's worth noting is the number of or the total uh, acreage that we farm today is not much more than it was back in the 70s and 80s. So the number of farms in America have declined, but yet we're able to produce more crops on the same acreage with less number of farms or less number of workers and people. So let's look back at 1946 again. And this blue line represents the total number of tractors produced per year. And if you can look right here, this is 1951. And I'll just tell you this blue line graph is not scaled appropriately on the chart. But this blue peak right here is 1951. And our, our tractor production had peaked at 564,000 units for that year in the United States. So if you look back in the 40s, we were significantly less than that, about half. And how did this happen? Why did this happen? I believe that after the war, there were several things going on. First of all, the culture in America was starting to change. The people that owned these 6 million farms were starting to get a little bit up in the years. Their uh, descendants were not taking over these farms. They were, uh, you know, coming back from the wartime. They were moving to the city. Uh, they were just you know, looking for other methods of income in general. The manufacturing industry was taken off again. The economy in the United States was doing really good. There were a lot more available jobs than just farming at that time. And quite frankly, there was a big demand for, uh, you know, people to fill these jobs in the manufacturing industries. So what started to happen is post-war, we're coming out of a war, our economy's doing good. We're not too many years out from the Great Depression. And we have all these farmers here that have been hoarding up this money. Because remember, during the wartime, tractor production was basically at zero. 
farmers were still farming. We still needed to produce crops, but there were no implements to buy that amounted to anything. There were no tractors to buy to amount to anything. Tractor production at its lowest output during any period in the war was about 100,000 units. So if you look at, uh, you know, nearly 6 billion farms in America, we only had 100,000 tractors that we could provide them for one particular year. You know, that's nothing. So coming out of the war, you had all these farmers that had a little bit of money to spend, and then they were in, you know, pretty good need. There was a big demand for newer tractors, better technology. And there's one technological advancement that's really worth noting, and it's the three-point hitch. Harry Ferguson had patented the first three-point hitch in 1926. Now, that technology did not hit America until it landed on a Ford 9N tractor, and that was in 1939. And that was just a little bit before the wartime had picked up. And remember, tractor production had really uh, took a slump there during the war. So there was this new piece of technology out there, and everybody wanted it, but we just didn't have the capacity to produce it and give it to the public. Now, coming after the war, we've got uh, a bigger workforce. We've changed the way we've trained people in manufacturing. We have new technology in the manufacturing industry because, remember, we had to support this war effort. So manufacturers got really smart on how they trained people, the technology that they used, the processes that they implemented. And now coming out of the war, we're going to put that stuff to the test. And that's why there's this huge increase in the amount of tractors produced coming after the war. First of all, it was the demand. And second of all, it was technology. So now if you look at that accumulated number of tractors built, that represents this, it's represented by this yellow bar here. You can look right here in the mid 50s, there were approximately just as many tractors out there as there were farms. So in other words, there was at least one tractor for every farm in America. That's pretty significant. And remember, this accumulated chart does not account for the tractors that were built, you know, before 1946. So actually, this yellow curve or yellow line should be actually moved back a little bit, probably back in here. So what does all this mean? And, and why is all this significant? Well, the number of farms started to decline over the years until it plateaued in, you know, the 70s and 80s. And we continued to build tractors over those years. The farms started to shrink. People started to leave the small farms that they grew up on. They started working in manufacturing environments. They started moving to suburbs. The GI Bill has got a lot to do with, with some of this too. And, and maybe we'll discuss that in another video. But one piece that directly ties to technology that has increased is, I think first and foremost, the manufacturing technology had increased, and that was why we were able to produce so many tractors directly after the war. Second of all, I like to think of, you know, the available horsepower or the affordable max horsepower for a tractor each year has significantly started to rise starting in, you know, the late 50s, early 60s, we really see this horsepower number start to climb up, and it really takes a jump in the early to late and mid 70s. And why is that significant? Well, this increased uh, horsepower per tractor meant that there was more work that could be done by a smaller group of people. So you don't need as many farms in America, you just need larger implements, and you need larger implements to get more work done. And to able to accommodate the larger implement, you have to have more horsepower. You know, this all makes sense. So technology really advanced, I think, for the agricultural industry between the 40s all the way up till the 70s. And, you know, why is that important? So we've taken a pretty good look at, you know, the available uh, workforce that we currently have, how many baby boomers are still in uh, the workforce. We've taken a look at how many baby boomers occupy uh, each sector of the skilled trades by, you know, electricians, mechanics, uh, engineers. We've looked at all that. And now we've also talked about how technology has really influenced the agricultural industry, the manufacturing industry, and how that's led to the decline of all of the farms across America, along with, you know, coming back off post-World War II, 
the GI Bill kicked in, uh, the culture in America started to change slightly, and people just weren't farming anymore. They left the farms to go to, you know, bigger cities, to go to the suburbs, support manufacturing industries. They had different skills, different uh, education level coming out of the war, and they were able to fill some of these jobs, some of these manufacturing jobs. So why is all this important? You know, we still haven't put the pieces of the puzzle together. So technology has basically led to the decline of the number of farms in America, amongst a few other things. But why is that really significant? Take a look at what it would take to operate a family farm in the 40s all the way up to the 50s and 60s. Take your mind back to that point in time, to those years, and really think what type of skills were required to exist and operate on a family farm. You know, these people were not work brittle uh, people. They, they contended with elements on a constant basis. You know, they, cabs on tractors with air conditioning and heat were really not a thing probably until, I'm going to guess, probably the 60s. And I'm sure there's a, a tractor guru out there that can confirm that. But, and there very well might have been, you know, tractors with cabs and air conditioning and heat before that, but was it really practical and was it really affordable to most farmers? And it probably wasn't. So first of all, these people were not work brittle. They knew what it was like to come overcome adverse conditions on a daily, weekly basis. That's the first thing. The second thing is the actual skill that was required. These people operated equipment, okay? A tractor is nothing more than a piece of equipment. It's a big tool. These people knew how to operate this equipment. Not only did they know how to operate this equipment, they knew how to work on this equipment. It was an advanced piece of technology, relatively speaking. You know, for them, it was an advanced piece of technology, but it was still not so complex that the average farmer of the time couldn't figure out how to work on it. They most certainly had the right number of tools, the proper tools, which didn't really amount to a whole lot in comparison to the quantity and the number of tools that you need to work on such equipment today. But they had the tools, they had the means, they had the want to, they had to come over adverse conditions to make things happen at the end of the day. I mean, that was their livelihood. If the tractor wasn't running, they were going to go hungry. And that may seem a little bit extreme, but that was their mentality. That was their thought process. So they knew how to operate equipment. They knew how to work on equipment. They also would have had some good carpentry skills. They would have built barns. They would have put up fence rows. They would have learned how to use other hand tools. Some of these people would have been, you know, an electrician for the most part. They weren't necessarily a licensed electrician like we think of them today. But these people would have been adding on to their barns. They would have been adding on to structures around the shop. They would have, you know, supported the shop with plumbing, with uh, electrical infrastructure. You think about all the skills that were required to maintain a family farm back in that time. And then take a look at today, current day, or maybe even the past 30 to 40 years. What type of environment do the generations from let's say the 90s to current day what level of skills do those people get exposed to in the home place you know if you grew up in the 40s all the way up until the 70s more than likely you would have been exposed to or not more than likely it was a good chance that you would have been exposed to a family farm or your parents would have grown up on a family farm and your parents would have acquired a lot of those skills and oftentimes, what do parents do? They pass along their skills to their children. So even if you grew up in the baby boomer generation and just a few years past that, you still would have acquired a lot of these skills that would have come from working on a farm. So this is the point. This is how technology has basically led to the demise of so many people that go out and pursue a career in the skilled labor trades. It's really simple. You have this generation that grew up on the farm. They knew how to work on stuff. They were naturally exposed to all these different skills that were required to maintain this farm and maintain their equipment. And then look at the generations now. These people do not get exposed to turning wrenches on a tractor. They don't get exposed to sawing up lumber to build a barn. 
they don't go out there and dig fence posts to put up a fence row. I mean, these people just don't do that like they used to back in that time period. And that's my point. We do not expose anyone to skilled labor like we used to back in the day. And I think because of that, skilled labor is maybe not as appealing to, you know, the most recent generations as it was maybe back in the 40s and 50s. The 40s and 50s had the generation of people that knew how to work on something because they were just exposed to it growing up. And then manufacturing increased. There was a demand for skilled labor in the workforce because now we needed electricians. We needed mechanics. We needed machinists. We needed all those people to fill those roles in the manufacturing industry. And then nowadays, if you look, those baby boomers have basically maintained the skilled labor all the way up to, you know, maybe the past 10 years or so when they've started to retire and leave the workforce. And now we don't have a big enough available workforce to come in and learn their trades and pass on their skills and knowledge and then, you know, take up the torch and run with it. So I hope you got a little bit of value out of the video. If you like what you see and you think you're going to get some more value in the future, please hit the subscribe button and click the notification bell and then you can be connected to the latest and greatest content. I plan on doing another video that's probably going to talk a little bit more about the GI Bill post-war and a little bit about uh, some things that had changed in our education system and tied into hopefully the number of skilled, uh, well, maybe not skilled labor colleges, but the either technical colleges or vocational systems in high school. I want to do a video about, you know, those topics and how that's also led to the decrease in the number of um, available uh, people that come up in the trades that take on the trades that, that quite frankly we need and it's just not there. So anyway, I hope you enjoyed the video and I'll see you next time.